Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer uh, for the Veterans History Project here in Cincinnati. Our interview today is being conducted at the Grosbeck Library Branch of the Hamilton County Library on Galbraith Road, and today's date is the 16th of June, 2014. Today, uh, we have the privilege of interviewing and speaking with a World War II veteran, Vernon Cecil Herbert. And uh, uh, may I call you Cecil then? Is that what yes. you like to go by? It's all right. Uh, Cecil, where were you born? What city? I was born in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana in uh, 1926. I see. And May the 18th, 1926. And I was born on Boyd Light Avenue, and I grew up selling papers on Sunday paper for 10 cents, mm -hmm. the Sunday Star, and uh, I worked all my life selling newspapers, I guess. I see. And uh, always out there to make a penny. Oh. And uh, I went to school 38, and the principal in there was a woman and she called us John Dillinger Gang the Second, because she taught John Dillinger in kindergarten. What well, year was this you were going there at school number 38? At school 38, I was, well, I was... You were what, about uh, in grade school? Yeah, you know, okay. first grade, kindergarten. I no, see. kindergarten, you went someplace else. Because, yeah. uh, and uh, we were so poor that you didn't pay for rent. Because the kids would tear the house down, left nobody lived in it. So I said, why didn't they, why didn't the landlord give us money to fix the house up? He said he didn't have the money either to buy the material. Because uh, all through, th I lived there in a five-room house in Indianapolis on Temple Street, and uh, and I had two uncles. What was your father and mother's name, though? We didn't mention oh, uh, that. Harry, Her Harry C. Herbert. And what did he do for a living? He was a paper hanger. A wallpaper? Yeah, wallpaper. Yeah. Yeah, paper hanging. And he was a carpenter. He made cabinets. But he, later on, well, they, him and my uncle sanded floors. And that's how comes they come to, to Ohio. In 1935, my uncle come up here because there was no work in, in, in uh, Indianapolis. Indianapolis was very poor. Mm -hmm. We had to steal the people's garbage to put the trash out. <laughs> we were so poor, you know, uh, estimating how poor that we was. Right. But, uh, and we had to walk around the corner to get the water, and I had to bring the water in from a double house in a bucket. And my brothers, older brothers, they brought the coal in from the shed out back. And uh, we always had a chicken coop, mm -hmm. raised chickens for eggs. And uh, I that, guess we got along fine, you know. And what was your mother's name then? Uh, Cirelli, S-Y-L-L-A-L-D-A, Cirelli Bolin. She was from Tell Accountant, Indiana, next to Tell City, Indiana, and uh, that's where my father was raised with my grandmother, which she was a Rothgerber. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, did your mother ever work? And did she ever have an employment? Oh, my mother worked at uh, Valvoline Oil Company. Oh, okay. And then she worked there at the cafeteria too, and and uh, so then uh, we finally got to Cincinnati, and my father had a hundred dollars, and so she he moved us to, from Indianapolis to Cincinnati, which rent was twenty eight dollars a month, and that's the way it was, and up until I don't know how long, and we moved here after the thirty seven flood. Right after the 37 flood, we moved in Cumminsville. We went to Garfield School. Garfield School? Yeah, over on Beekman Street. On Beekman Street? Yeah. Okay. And uh, I went there in the, well, fifth and sixth grade. Then I ended up down to Camp Washington Junior High School, which was an automatic, it was a workshop. 
to teach you how to do carpenter work and electric work. Where was that located at? That was in Camp Washington, by the registrar's on the Hoppo Street. Okay. And they tore it down now, but it was a great school. It was central vocational. Mm -hmm. Later on, and then after that, why they done away with it, oh, and which was a good school yeah. to teach people the trades, sheet metal work, auto mechanic, mm -hmm. and uh, woodworking, and printing, and draftman. And they taught all, all that stuff, you know, like a half days. And I graduated there in the ninth grade. And I went back to the fifth grade, and if I'd have stayed with it, they'd have made another grade for 11th. So I finally, I, I got out on a work permit with my father. I see. Said I helped him have paper hanging. And so then I went to work at different places. And I guess I'm one of the old hack driver, the last one in Cincinnati that drove a motorcycle with a sidecar on it for Hess Blueprint. And then I went What'd to... What'd you do for a Hess Blueprint? Delivered? Delivered, delivered with a motorcycle, okay. a sidecar, and, uh, and they called you hack drivers. And of course, uh, uh, that's a different thing. My brother owned a motorcycle shop, and he brought the English motorcycles in. and. I I had one for 40 years, but never owned one because he always give me one. I see. And well, you uh, didn't, I didn't ask you. Uh, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I got two sisters and two brothers, and uh, the, uh, the sisters are all younger, and the brothers are older. And uh, my brother was uh, one of them was in the army, and one was in the navy. What were their names? Uh, Melvin Herbert and Forrest C. Herbert. I see. And Forrest was the one that brought that big tank over on Harrison Avenue there to Veterans Park. He and only was the one that brought it. And uh, he, he uh, engineered it because he was on the committee down in, <coughs> in uh, <coughs> Kentucky. And uh, so. Uh, uh, even both of them passed on in 89 and my father what died. Do you, what do you mean they brought a tank? A tank, an army tank. Oh, and That the, army tank over there. Uh, under the VFW? It. Yeah, under the VFW's name over to Veterans Park on uh, Harrison Avenue. Oh yes, that's where Tom Griffin always was. Yeah, that yeah. was where they married Tom Griffin. You was there that day. Yes. Well, they had him laid out outside. Tom was a good friend of mine. Yes. And his daughter, his granddaughter, uh, do little granddaughter from California, want to write my history. Yeah, we um, got to get her back in town. Um, what'd your sisters do then? I, uh, one worked for Northside Bank, and the other one was worked at the Esquire Theater up in Clifton. Sure, sure not. And she sold tickets up there, and uh, and she went to Indiana, but. So you um, you moved to Cincinnati and uh, right after the thirty seven flood, right? You went to the vocational school, and then you're going to Garfield for five and sixth right. grade. And then you got your father got you out on a work permit, and you started working with him. Uh, well, and, yeah, and uh, and, and uh, also delivering that you had a job delivering for Hess. Blueprint. Yeah, yeah, and then I went to Revival, and I ended up at the Ohio Knife Company because that was a family deal. When you turned 17, you just walked in and went to work. Because you knew the boss, you knew the owner, which was Randolph, and everybody in the neighborhood worked for the Ohio Knife Company. Where was that located at? On Draven Avenue, across the street from Weber's Cafe. I see. That was an old college residence, and I lived behind there. and in a five-room house for $35 a month. So you uh, worked at uh, at the Ohio Knife Company. How long did you work there? About eight years. And then I decided that I don't want to sit here and watch that wheel go around on that grinder. So I looked out on the railroad, and I said, that's for me. And I seen the flagman go by and standing on that caboose and that sunshiny day, and I said, that's for me. I didn't know it snowed until I went on the railroad, and I worked on the B and O railroad for 37 and a half years. What did you do for the railroad? What was your uh, job? I, I was a conductor. I guess I'm the last living conductor on the Cincinnati train. 
yet today. Because they didn't promote me because uh, I was qualified. And like they told me, I said, I want a passenger representative to know how much to charge people. He said, the superintendent, my boss told me, he said, you don't know what to charge, let them ride for nothing. So I, I took their money and bought them a ticket, and made sure I didn't have no cash. Where did you normally uh, ride between? What city? Cincinnati and Toledo. I was on the Toledo division, and I was a local chairman, which was a lawyer. And I'd say, don't you do it, they'll fire you, but they won't fire me because I know too many people. And uh, as long as I was local chairman, nobody on the B&O got fired. There's a guy told me, and they tell me today that I made more money than I knew the contract. And I changed it from outer house days to a, a decent place to go to right. the Tarlin. Because I told him, I said, if you don't have a decent place, stop the train any place you want to and go, you go. Because uh, I changed the rule uh, so many of the, oh, that's a long story, you know. But you worked for the railroad for 37 years. 37 and a half years, yeah. I see. And you ran all that time between Cincinnati and Toledo, or did you have other routes? Well, I worked in Kentucky and in, in, in the yards in Cincinnati. But I was the first guy that ever got the city of Cincinnati to give me my money back. That they charged me taxes because it was give and take proposition. Because I, I didn't earn my money in Cincinnati, I earned it all in Kentucky and, and out on the road. I see. So uh -huh. uh, it was a give and take proposition, but uh, we could go on and on. Well, so much about railroading, but let's um, uh, let's discuss now. Where uh, the events leading up to the war, World War II. Uh, where do you recall where you were or what you were doing on uh, December the seventh? 1941. I was selling papers at uh, Chase and Hamilton in front of Montague's Drug Store when the war broke out with Japan, and uh, I was only about 14 to then. Ten, uh, uh, born in seven. 26, you can uh, figure it out. Uh, yeah, 36 and five. You're 15 years old then, yeah, roughly. Yeah, about 15. And, yeah. Uh, of course, I sold papers on those corner to Bulldog Edition, to all through Northside and on my what, bicycle. What's a Bulldog Edition? It was like coming out at nine o'clock on the race results. I see. <laughs> so, so, uh, and so then I, from the knife company, I went on the railroad, and then from the railroad. Well, before that, I, I uh, during the time I worked at the knife company is when I was enlisted in the Navy when I turned 17. Well, uh, so w when did you enlist in the Navy? Do you recall the date? Uh, March the 4th of 1944. I see. Yeah. And, uh, and where did you go to basic at then? I went to Chicago and uh, for boot camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, we went to uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, to the gunnery school. And uh, from there, we went to New Orleans and shipped out. I uh, made two trips to South America, all the way to Argentina, because it was a neutralized country. And you put away your guns and your bullets and everything, and you went in there with the Germans. And I couldn't figure out why they had such a nice town here. And they'd done everything free for the servicemen. You go to skating rink, you go to show, you ride taxi cabs for nothing. And I couldn't figure it out. But now I, f I know why, because all the rich German people went there. And well, uh, now Argent Argentina was a neutral country during World neutral War II. Neutral country, yeah. And you saw a lot of Germans there? At the no, I didn't see no Germans. No, uh, They said there was Germans there, but I didn't see none. As far as I go, you know. Well, who do you think was paying for your free rides and shows and things? I like? guess the Germans was, I guess. Uh -huh. what, was city was, what city was that? That know? was uh, uh, Buenos Aires in Margin, Argentina. Because they took us out into the country for uh, beer and uh, 
they roasted a whole cow on a spick, and they just cut off chunks of meat in different places and give them to us. Well, what, 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 what was your purpose in going down to Argentina, though? Were you carrying some type of cargo, or what? I guess uh, I, I always said we were delivering pots and pans that you couldn't buy in the United States during the war because of the ration. So many people that during the war was so rationed with jobs and everything else. Mm -hmm. and like the knife company I all worked at. And they, they couldn't give you a raise. Right. A new, new fellow, they could give more than an old fellow because he had no limit. Right. And uh, it, was, it was a hard situation to live in during the war because you black market people was so bad. You must buy, buy gasoline for a dollar a quarter a gallon. And every time the gas station got broke in, they wouldn't take the money, they'd take the ration stamps. Well, then they'd go to the ration board and get a new thing, and then they had plenty of gas. Uh, that's another yeah. thing. Well, how long were you in, uh, in uh, Argentina then, in Buenos Aires? I was did you stay there long or just? Uh, two or three days. Oh. Three, three or four days at most. How many trips did you make to? Uh, South America. Yeah. Two. I made two trips to South America. Then I come back, and uh, they didn't have us. The Japanese was the Germans were dying off, you know. So they sent us back to school and sent us down to Shelton, Virginia. Yeah, you know, we went to Shelton, Virginia. It was a gunnery school, and the uh, reason why. I didn't make nothing more than the seamen first class. They didn't need no petty officers. They had all they wanted, you know. They done made them all. Yes. It's just like a conductor. I was a conductor. I had a conductor hat on on TV, and uh, they said, "Why wasn't the, the old fellow was a hundred years old? Why he wasn't a conductor? He was just a trainman." I said, "Well, when he retired, he opened the door for me. So mm -hmm. then that's when I got to be a conductor." I see. Then they give me the the badge to wear, and they couldn't figure it out. But that's why. Well, and what were you doing in Shelton, Virginia? At a gunnery school. Okay. A re re rephrasing class. Re uh, in order to get didn't have nothing to do, so they put us back to school. We we didn't need us. We had so many people, men in the Navy Reserves. Mm -hmm. that, uh, so then they sent me to, then they got a troop ship out, a troop train out, and they sent me all the way to Frisco, San Francisco. I think we was about seven days on that troop train. How'd you get there? Oh, you went by, by train? By rail, yeah. Oh, I see. And, uh, oh, it took us, I don't know how many days it was, Anyway, we ended up in uh, Frisco at Treasure Island. And from Treasure Island, they finally uh, sent me to Portland, Oregon by rail. And we went up in the mountains and we got to Portland. Portland was a most beautiful city. They was, the people in there treated you like you was a, a good uh, Samaritan. Is Portland on the water? Uh, on the yeah, it's on the, on the Pacific. Well, on the Pacific Ocean, yeah. I see. It's a coastal town then. Yeah, it's so. Uh, so at this time, after you left San Francisco and went up to Portland, you didn't have a ship assigned. You weren't assigned to a ship yet. No, no. Uh, I was uh, when I was in New Orleans after I made two trips on the T.J. Jackson. Yeah, you know, to South America, and brought coffee back from uh, Santos, Brazil. A sack of coffee, and uh, then uh, they sent me to. Uh, well, who'd you unload the coffee to? It, the coffee was for the United States. I see, and you unloaded mm -hmm. that in what city? In New Orleans. In New Orleans. Yeah, you, down the I mean, you're talking a lot of coffee then. Oh yeah, we sold ship full of coffee. I see. Oh yeah, the old coffee comes from Santa's Brazil. No matter how what you buy here, it's still from Santa's. 
That's my book. Okay. And then uh, the Air Force, always at Shelton, Virginia, during that time. Well, they sent me to Pasigula, Mississippi for uh, a transport ship. And uh, they didn't need us because there was about 58 men on a gun crew on a transport. The Merchant Marines run the ship. The Army was in charge of it. And they had Army troops on there. And then they had Navy gun crew which Roosevelt put us back into service. And we was on everything with an American flag on it. That's why I say don't go on no ship that don't have an American flag on it because they all took the flag down and went to a foreign country to pay the tax over there because it's cheaper. So we don't have no maritime service no more. Uh, but of course we don't need it. Were these Navy ships you were on or Merchant Marines? These were Merchant Marines merchant ships, Liberty yeah. ships and a Victory I, ship. Yeah, that's... A Victory mean, ship uh, do 12 mount knots and a Liberty would normally do 8 knots. It was lucky it was moving. And... Uh, so from Mississippi, did you go back to Shelton and then San Francisco? I went to New Orleans because uh, they didn't need me. Okay. In Pasigula, Mississippi, they, they didn't. They had too many men there, and we had bad, flat feet. <laughs> and and the, the doctors in there at the time for the arch supports, they cut them out of felt felt pad and put them glued them in your shoes. They like to kill men. Red guy from Arkansas, and I took mine out, and threw them away, and went on. <laughs> And we had no doctors. We had no doctors. All we had was a, a Lieutenant J.G. and a boatswain mate. He was in charge of the gun crew. And uh, we didn't have no doctor. If we got sick, they had to put us on a hospital ship, which one the fellow did, a merchant marine got burnt, and they put him on a hospital ship coming out of, uh, oh, I don't know where it was, up in the, in the Pacific, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you got sick, you went to a private doctor. And then, and like in South America, you go to a doctor down there, you didn't have no, you didn't have no VA hospital to go to. Uh -huh. So we had no records of us. All you had to be is healthy. And, uh, and like women. So right. you wasn't gay, <laughs> you know, as they say now, don't, tell don't say nothing and so yeah. anyway uh, so uh, I well, went to uh, I went to uh, went to Portland Oregon and stayed up there for a while worked in the shipyard which uh, they, uh, you could come and go pretty good easy up there and which they took care of people took good care of you up in Portland did you live on base or where yeah I lived on the base yeah, I see. And, uh, what base was that, do you recall? No, it didn't have no name. I see. Just like the Armed Guard like, Center. Uh, a naval, but to the naval shipyard. Yeah, yeah, it was a Navy, off of the Navy shipyard, yes. And we worked in the shipyards and part-time and, and uh, so then they uh, signed me to uh, the Capital Victory, which was a victory ship. All that was brand new, you know. And uh, so then we come down to uh, Frisco to Oakland, and uh, May the 8th was D-Day when the Germans surrendered. And well, I was loaded up with 50-pound bombs for Okinawa. And uh, our galley was shut down. Big celebration we had that day. And a uh, little cubby hole sold egg sandwiches, so we had one for dinner and one for supper. And that, that's all the food that we had that day mm -hmm. for celebration of the German surrender, May the 8th. And, but we was loading up for a 50 pound bomb for Okinawa, so it wasn't a big deal for us, you know, because we'd done. The Air Force told me two months ahead of time, it was scuttlebutt that the war was going to end in mm. Japan. In Japan? Uh, yeah. Uh, at that time, they were putting out the scuttlebutt, but we didn't thought it was scuttlebutt right. because it was May and the war ended August the fifteenth. Right. And uh, so we uh, 
we had all these ammunition and we went to Okinawa. And during the time we was in Okinawa, a typhoon hit. So the army was on there uh, shackling up these bombs that we had, keep them from rolling around, exploding. Mm -hmm. Of course, they wouldn't explode anyway, I guess, because. Uh, uh, but uh, going back to uh, to Oakland, we degalvanized the ship one night. And that was wrapping that cable around with a thing, and they didn't tell us we was going to have to work all night. And that was the worst night I put in the service. Was putting that degalvanized and taking the magnet out of the ship. And we oh. had to we had to run that cable around there twenty some times. And uh, that was the hardest night we had because they didn't tell us who was going to be up all night. And uh, that was that victory ship it was brand new, so they had to take the magnet out of it so they couldn't pick it up with submarines. So uh, anyway, uh, we ended up in about 28 days, to, uh, ended up at Okinawa, Buckner Bay. And during what, that time- What bay? Buckner Bay. Oh yes. It was General Buckner. Right. They called it Buckner Bay. Yeah. And. Uh, he was killed there on April the first. If I'm, or he was killed there in April of forty-five. Oh, most likely first. Uh, That's when the big invasion was. Simon Bolivar Buckner. That was, yeah. Oh, was it? Okay, yeah. he knows more about it than I do. No. But uh, but anyway, uh, there was a Liberty ship, and it washed ashore. If you didn't take up anchors and go to sea in convoy, and we'd get lost. And that old captain of ours was a maritime man, and he would have us back in to drop an acorn the next morning after the storm. And that storm was rough, I'll tell you. You thought you were going to break in two, and if you slept in a uh, horizontal position, you had to put your toes over to keep in the bunk. And then uh, he could roll you out of the bunk because you had a railing around it. But mm -hmm. it was a. Uh, Hell of a storm, I tell you, if you want to call it a storm, but it was a typhoon. So, uh, and I asked a guy later on, I said, What happened to the post office? He said, You know, he said that typhoon, they, they bombed the, the flood wall. And there they had no protection, and, and, uh, and uh, the town was there and uh, so we went ashore and got the mail and one time the maritime service went and they took the captain in there and they went up the river and the tide went out. They were left high and dry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how they got back to the ship but they got back to the water. Yeah. They had to wait the tide come in to get right. the up the river because they took transferred things in there but that was the only it was the only island uh, we stopped at the Marshalls, and they was nothing but sand in the Marshall Islands. And uh, when we got to Okinawa, why, it was green trees. I said, this was something worthwhile we fought for. Mm -hmm. It was 150 miles from Japan, I think. And uh, so, uh, come, come the 9th, about 9.30, and uh, uh, we was uh, dropped anchor out in Buckner Bay, and uh, and the army said uh, the war's over, six days ahead of time. And uh, now this is August the ninth you're talking about. Yeah, yeah August you, the ninth, six right. days before the war ended. Right. So uh, the boatswain on there, the, the yeah the boatswain. He was a gunner second class. He said we could fire the guns. So what did we do? Went up and I let the radio operator shoot my gun. Because it was the first time he got to shoot a gun before he got out of the Navy. Mm -hmm. So I left him, strapped him in, and I cocked the gun, and he let go of it. And first thing you know, we, the guy, the other Navy guy had the earphones on, and he wasn't saying nothing. And we looked up, and the lieutenant was standing there, and he hollered, "Cease fire!" And I, uh, by that time, I had touched the gun, the radio operator on the arm, and he was down around the stirrup with his feet around it, and because it vibrated you down, 
and that made the gun go up in the air, and he was shooting the antennas off of the ship. Oh my God. And so when I stopped him, why he shot 28 rounds out of 52 magazine, and uh, so. Uh, he had us up on the boat deck that day, up on the captain's deck. And I think that's when I started being the local chairman, talking for my men. I said, for as I know you fall overboard at supper. I said, you wasn't around. And, he, and, 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 and the gunner's mate said we could fire the, the guns. So he said, okay. So next morning he had us up there again. So I was talking for the again, men again. I was doing all of them because if uh, if I jumped overboard, there'd be nine of us going to have to follow me because they followed me around. If uh, they knew I was going for something better, and uh, it's just like that. And so then we loaded up with uh, 28. I think it was 28 soldiers. They took the Piper Cubs. No, that's after I went back to the marshals on the victory ship. So three days later, the war ended. Well, we didn't care because we done celebrated. So six days later, we ended up in the marshals, and uh, the gun gunners gunner officers said, that, uh, "Now, fellas, uh, they need so many gun crews and signalmen and petty officers." But he says, I'm going to count all that ammunition that you used for practice. So we have something to show that we got rid of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was painting that deck. And I told my paintbrush down, I said, uh, we're going to, we'll are going, we finish help painting whenever we find out who's going to stay and who's going to go. But he got rid of everybody that had anything to do with the shooting so that he wouldn't have to if there was a consequences about it when we got back to the States. So they took us over to put us on an old rusty Thomas F. Hunt, Liberty ship. Thomas old F. what? Liberty ship. What was the name of it again? Thomas F. Hunt. Hunt, okay. And uh, it was a rusty old thing because we used to be on this new ship, Victory ship. And uh, so, uh, they had a motor launch there and done picking us coming for us. And he done know who was going because everybody that had anything to do with the shooting in Okinawa. So we got on this old ship that had Pep Piper Cubs airplanes in plastic bo and plywood boxes all the way up to the wheelhouse. You could just see out. Uh -huh. I think that's the only time I got in a crow's nest because you could walk across there get in a crow's nest. Uh -huh. And uh, we didn't have to watch in a crow's nest, but we did have to watch eight on and eight off. And they had general quarters on the ship. The Navy had uh, at morning and nighttime, you had to all, everybody turned to, no matter whether you was on watch or you was on the 12 to four watch. You know, 12 to four watch, you got off for an hour and you went to sleep. But, we went when we went first went there. We crossed the date line in South America. Well, we crossed the equator, and we got a. Um, uh, I got pictures of it there where they they can't do it to do you the way they did you uh, in them days. Nowadays they can't uh, make you drink salt water, things like that. But but boy, in, uh, in them days, they took a week off. They took a week before they got everything ready for you to go over the equator, going to South America. And of course, and then I, I went over the equator and on the Pacific side too when I went to Okinawa. But then you had the day line, a date line, which was a day different. So you got, uh, I think you got 40 minutes short of four hours or your 12 to four watch. And I said, oh, what are we going to do when we come back? We're going to have to make it up. <laughs> you know, instead of four hours, we said four hours and four hours, 45 minutes, 40 minutes. So anyway, uh, they took me off the ship at the marshals after the war ended and mm -hmm. put us on that old Liberty Thomas F. Hunt and sent us back with Piper Cub airplanes. 
Well, they decided then they take the Piper Cub airplanes off and put dog houses on there and put 28 soldiers on there. That was over there four and five years. I couldn't figure that out, but I guess they took their leave wow. and went over there, you know. And uh, them guys was all puny and, and pale and underfed. And we, we always had a mess, man, and had three meals and double dessert if we wanted it or whatever we wanted, you know. Mm -hmm. we, we ate the same food the captain ate in the maritime service or the officers ate. And, uh, 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 Cecil, what did you do with the uh, Piper Cubs that were? They just piled them over the airport. Uh, where at? On Okinawa. On Okinawa. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the, the guy, next guys went over there later on the next war. They said they were still piled up over there. You could have had one if you'd have got it back to the United States some way, <laughs> you know, folded it back or what on arm. And they were still there in the boxes. Yeah, they still sat in there in the boxes, and they never did take them out. But uh, we had these uh, 28. Of course, the war was over. Then we turned the lights on because you had blackout during the war. You, you uh, unscrewed the light bulbs out of the, make sure nobody turned them on, right. and you opened the portholes. You had metal covers for the portholes, and uh, so. Uh, so it was 28 days getting back, I guess. And them fellas all fat and sassy and rosy cheeks mm -hmm. because all they did was eat three meals and eat out of our icebox at nighttime. <laughs> you know, and of course we uh, had the lights on and we didn't have to stand too many watches. We had an hour on, I think an hour off. Now you're on three. the hut still. Yeah. yeah on the T.J. Uh, Jackson. Oh. Thomas F. Hunt, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. So you're leaving the Marshall Islands and you're coming where? Going where? Was that they were going home on the Capital Victory. Okay. Uh, and they took us off there to Marshalls and sent us back to Okinawa because they needed a full grunt crew to go back to Okinawa. Oh, okay. And while we was in Okinawa, we went through seven typhoons. And, uh, And uh, like I said, that that Liberty ship in the next war, they said was still there, it was high and dry. And I noticed after we ceased fire, we were celebrating six days before the war ended. Why, uh, they must have shot every shell they had on that Liberty ship that was, uh, was up on the banks. And uh, I noticed we did have blacktop highways on Okinawa and sewer lids, and and, uh, and the only girls was was way up in the rice paddies. I had a picture of them, but I lost it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, what city were you near? Ta uh, Naha. Naha. Yeah. Yeah. Naha was nothing but a junkyard. <laughs> Muddy streets. No Muddy. sidewalks. No nothing. It just had a thing like an arch over yeah. saying Naha. Right. Uh, I had a picture of it, but yeah. I, 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 I took it to Lima and showed it to some railroaders up there, and I had these women working in the rice paddy. Of course, at that time, they told you if you had anything to do with the Oki woman, they'd put you on an island for eight years and see if you had the AIDS. I must have, it must have been the AIDS because it took that long to kill you. And, uh, but, uh, well, you weren't supposed to eat any of their vegetables or fruit. Didn't they tell you that? Well, we didn't. Uh, we went ashore one time, and we wanted to do some work for the Army. And he said, no. He said, I got everything cleaned up. He said, but I got some cornbread in there you guys can have. So we ate that cornbread, and I think that's the only thing we ate ashore was oh, that okay. done one time was cornbread. And, uh, so how long did you stay there at Okinawa then before you got to come home, or did you come home from there? Well, I come back. I come back on that Liberty on that Liberty ship with those soldiers, troop trained, and the war was over, and then we were run with the lights on, so we didn't have to make up at 40 minutes over that date line. That was nice about that. But uh, 
and then uh, we got back to uh, Frisco, Frisco, and uh, when? What was it uh, about the date that you got back there? Well, I see. It wasn't long. It was in '46. Uh, it must have been in. Oh, when I get out, I got out February. I went in March, in February. So uh, that must have been about uh, for about the Christmas time. Okay. Yeah, because I come home for 30 days, because I knew uh, over there, at when we got taken off the ship, uh, Thomas F. Hunt, I know we come through the underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, and uh, the baker was a good friend of mine. He was a merchant marine, mm -hmm. and he had a broom sticking it through there and waking me up, saying, "Hey, we're home." I said, oh, well, and then I said, oh, golly. So they they wanted me to stay on there, but I wouldn't stay on there. I said, I'm going to go over to Algiers in, in Frisco, and they got so many people over there, they won't know whether you tell them the truth or not. And so I told them, I said, it's been nine months since I've been home. So they said, 30 days in traveling times. So we went to, we, we I got a train out of Oakland, and uh, we had a cane seat, and we picked up a bunch of soldiers over there, and they got in there with their overcoats, and they laid down the owls. I said, I'd swap this seat any time for an overcoat. <laughs> coming, coming on, boy, we got the, got the Great Lakes, and we were discharged, being discharged out of Great Lakes, and. Uh, Oh, I come home, and then, uh, then I went back to Great Lakes. I went back down to Crane, Indiana. Yeah, on to Washington, Indiana. That was an ammunition depot down there. Okay. And uh, I had to put in a few more to the days before I had enough points to get out. So they sent me down. They, when I come off of leave, they, they must have wanted me to go to San Diego, and I said, no, I don't want to go to San Diego. You said I was going to Washington, D.C., uh, Washington, Indiana, Crane, Indiana, down to the ammunition depot. So, uh, oh, okay, go on back home, we'll call you again. So uh, I, I, they, they wouldn't say goodbye to me no more because I come back so many times. So then I went down to Crane, Indiana, and finally then I went to Chicago and got discharged and come back. Now, when did you get discharged? Uh, February of 46? Yeah, February of 46. Yeah, because I went in March of 44. Right. Uh, I, could, I was in there for 23 months. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the armed guard, you got around a lot, see, because you, you went back to base and you, you, you missed the ship. And they put a new crew on there, and so you had different ships. Like I was on the a USATC Owl in, in Pasaguma. That was at Army Transport. Mm -hmm. That was a big ship. As I said, the Merchant Marines run it, and the Army was in charge of it, and the Navy was a gun crew, and they delivered the, the Marines, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so. Uh, Anyhow, I uh, so you um, so about all we made was a seaman first class because they they had all the petty officers they wanted. You all know, the rank was taken up. All right? the rank was yeah. taken up by yeah. then. Uh, They're only allowed. I mean, the war was uh, war was over with the government. Like I say, with the scuttlebutt was two months ahead of time when the war was going to end, and it did end on August fifteenth, mm. but. I lost a letter that I sent the wife, so I have no backing on what I said when only the wife knows. Well, now you you mentioned your wife. Um, were you when did you were going? Were you married during the war? Or no? Yeah, I went to South America and then come back and got married. And then, like I said, I was in love and I wanted to get the hell out of the navy. <laughs> so you got married while you were still in the yeah, navy then? Yeah, you know, uh, February the sixth. We've been married 70 years, same woman.
Yeah. And, oh, that's uh, wonderful. Uh, yeah. And how many children did you have? I had uh, four. Four? Yeah, two boys and two girls. A girl and a boy and a girl and a boy. Now, are they all still living here in Cincinnati? No, three of them lives in Cincinnati and uh, around. And the one, uh, Nancy, she lives in Pennsylvania because her husband run beneficiary years ago and he got with the Ford Company and the Ford Company took him to Columbus and then to Pennsylvania. And uh, they're all great kids. And is your wife still living? The wife's still living. The wife's uh, on a walker, but... And where do, you, where do you live now then? Uh, I live see. in Corrine Township. And uh, I bought a house out there in 71. I built a house in Corrine Township on Sheet Road in 55. I moved out of the next door to Weber's. Now when you came home uh, after uh, you were discharged, uh, did you go back to work for Ohio Knife then? Yes. And yeah, I worked a couple and more years at the Ohio Knife. And then, t then you went to work for the... Uh, 50, 1952, uh, July, the, July, no, February the... In February, I went to work on a railroad. BNO Railroad. Yeah, February yeah. the 12th. February 12th, 1952. And but yeah. between uh, 46 and 52, you were at Ohio Knife? Yeah. I see. Was your dad working there also or not? No, no, he was, he was still paper hanging. Still paper hanging. Yeah, and uh, like I said, uh, Ohio Knife Company, uh, it was a family affair. And you turned 17, you just automatically went to work. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, because uh, everybody in the neighborhood worked at Ohio Knife. Now you have uh, grandchildren now, and oh yeah, I got great. grandchildren. There, one one's on the fire department, and he's a captain up at Hamilton and Main Street. And, and then I got another grandson. He's on the Cincinnati fire department, which they love the job. Mm -hmm. And oh golly! Now, did, after you got out of the Navy, did you? Uh, stay associated with any of your buddies or with the Navy at all, or did you just go on to very, civilian? Very, very few. Uh, I joined an organization called the uh, Armed Guard, and we got 20,000 members in it, but uh, we we're too old to have any conventions, and we had conventions all over the United States. How old are you now then? I'm 88 now. 88. I just turned 88, May the 18th. And you've been married 70 years at 88. 70 years. I got married when I was a kid. Yeah, 18, yeah. Yeah. Well, most of us did. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, is there anything else you would uh, like to add about your naval experiences before we uh, finish our... Well, as I tell the young fellows, I say, stay on the path. Don't get off the path. You're going to get off the path and you're going to get in trouble. Stay on the path and do as you're sold because you got to nowadays to stay in or they'll get rid of you. Get rid of you now, yeah. Yeah, and uh, can't get away with stuff like you used to. No, not like we did, no. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Vernon, we appreciate uh, having this interview with you and. Uh, Good luck to you in the future. I appreciate it very much, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.